to thank you, Jesus. Oh. We worship you, God. We worship We lift up a sacrifice of praise. We lift up holy hands and pure hearts unto heaven today. God almost thought out of life. Yay! Jesus. Jesus. Mighty God. Hallelujah, hallelujah, hallelujah. Thank you, mighty God. Praise God, praise God. Amen. When the Spirit descends, we recognize and make room for the Spirit of God. I just want the Spirit of God to know, Lord, you are welcome in this place. Push back, push through our agenda protocols, and let us be led by the Spirit. If you're new here, maybe you're streaming online. The Spirit of God descended, and so we just stepped aside, lifted up our hands, and gave thanks. That's what Spirit-filled churches do. We crave for a move of God. We crave to hear from God. In fact, if God doesn't show up and descend, I drive home, I'm sorely disappointed. But I've yet to drive home on a Sunday and be disappointed because we're looking and expecting for the Spirit of God that can do more than a message, that can do more than our intellect. And so church, we need God moving on our behalf. Praise God, praise God. Let's thank the Lord with an offering of praise. Praise God, praise God. Amen. If you're visiting here, I welcome you. God bless you for coming and worshiping with us in Old Town Temecula. Amen. If you're streaming online, I recognize you. Thank you for leveraging technology when you can't get here. And those of you that call this home, I say thank you for coming home on Sunday. We have a wonderful church family. I'm honored to serve God and lead God's people. And I just wake up on Sundays and think to myself, today I get to go to church. I get to go. And I'm honored to be here. Nolan's already mentioned it, but I give honor to his parents, brother and sister Graham, visiting from Southern Illinois. Amen. God bless you guys. Welcome to SoCal. Glad that you are here and your son is making an impact here. So as a parent, be proud. When our kids serve God, when they're on their own and they can make their own choices and they choose that, it's a great feeling. When they make other choices, it's devastating. There's no guarantee. Huh? We do our best. We, we raise them in the admonition of God and we dedicate them. But at some point they make decisions and I pray that all of our kids make decisions that make us proud. And so that's a great life and God will help us. Amen. While you're standing, Proverbs chapter 22 and verse 9. The New King James Version reads this way, He who has a generous eye will be blessed. He who has a generous eye. Let me just pause. You're going to see whatever you're looking for. You're looking for negativism? You're going to find it. You're looking for carnality and meanness and darkness? You're going to find it. But today I kind of want to flip the coin over and say, how about we look for the goodness and the greatness and the generosity that God affords us? I'm going to preach to you, mention to you, giving reimagined, but let me just give you my subtitle here, which is living a life of generosity. Lord Jesus, help me one more week to speak into the hearts of your people, to speak into our habits, our views, the cadence in which we live life, that it would honor you and that we'd be in harmony and under covering and you would pour out blessings and opportunities more than we can contain, as your scripture says. Allow us to be a candidate of that scripture living in Temecula. Give me words of wisdom, Lord, to bring knowledge and understanding and inspiration. I rebuke any distractions 
that the enemy would come into our mind in our midst and that we would stand and sit in the Holy of Holies with respect and honor as you speak to your church. Help me do a good job in Jesus' name. If you agree with me, would you shout back amen? Amen, amen. amen. God bless you for standing. You can be seated this morning. I realize that Jesus said it is more blessed to give than to receive. And if we're not careful at times, we can feel like I'm not giving of my money. I'm not giving of my time. I'm not going to give my resources. I'm not going to give anyone my talents. But in reality, when we do give, we are serving and glorifying God. I, I, I pause for a minute to remind us that all good gifts come from God. So if there's anything good in your life, it came from God. You are stewarding the goodness. You are stewarding the generosity. And just like any of us would think in the human mind, I know God's ways are so far above our ways. But when you give something to somebody and they take care of it and they use it and they appreciate it, does it not want you to make you to give them more because they appreciate what you gave them? Conversely, if you give something to somebody or you give something or you give a hand-me-down and they don't use it, they don't care for it, they don't take care of it, they don't appreciate it, and I think our natural tendency is, well, I don't think I'm going to give them something else again. I don't, I'm not upset, but they weren't as much of a steward as I thought. And somewhere in my life and as I preach and live, I think God is a little bit that way too. As, as we steward the generosity and our talents and our resources, and, and we start to develop an eye for generosity, we go around saying, God, who or what can I bless? What, what do you see that maybe I don't see? God, where can I make a difference? And when you have a generosity, an eye of generosity, the scripture says this, that you will be blessed. Amen. Come on, someone shout, I want to be blessed. Excuse me, technology. No, I don't want to start a workout. <laughs> and quit asking me. Okay, anyway, I am an independent. I understand why it wants to know that. <laughs> I, I, I get it, but right now, technology, AI, leave me alone. But, and so, so I, I'm wanting to bring to us as we move forward. Again, you, you've heard it over and over. Pastor Waddle last week, me two weeks ago. We, we have our eyes and our sight set on the next frontier. Biblical version, the promised land. That, that we're looking for property, we're looking for a building. And, and I realize in order for us to get there, I'm a businessman by nature. I was self-employed for 17 years. I started a printing and graphics design company in San Diego at, at 32 years old. Walked away from that. So my natural tendency is, is to be on the business side. And I, I get business and I get finances. But you know what? I also get the kingdom of God and the principles of the word of God. So, so in, in me, I think you get the best of both worlds. I have faith, but I don't have reckless faith. I don't have faith that, okay, well, we're going to buy a $6 million building, and I just know by faith the checks, someone's going to deposit in our account. They're going to zail into our account or do a cashier check or a wire transfer straight to the bank so I don't have to worry about it. No, that's reckless faith. Okay? So I have faith. that I don't have everything figured out. I don't know how it's all going to come together. But with faith in God, and when we put our trust together for the purpose in the kingdom of God, God begins to do things that we can't do. Things begin to happen in the supernatural. In any church I know in our movement, in any amazing accomplishments they've done, there's always been God moments along the way that were not man-made, my friend. But it came from the people of God, or the acquaintances of them, or the network from the people of God, because somebody knew somebody that knew somebody, and somebody did this, and they won this, and they gave this to the church, and they paid cash for a building, they paid cash for a land. There's something that's supernatural, but if we don't begin to look at things through the eyes of God, the eyes of flesh, the eyes of humanity is about me. It's what I call, it's a me-centric world. It all over around me. I'm the sun and everybody else are planets. In my solar system, that's not good. No, God is the sun. Hey, that kind of works, you read that? The sun, S-U-N for now. And we evolve around his workmanship. And I just understand at my age and my tenure and my pastoring and people that I've seen, God trusts people with resources. So my question to you this morning, if you're going to live a life of generosity, generosity means, hey, I have enough for me. I have plenty. I have more than I actually need to survive. And now I'm going to be generous and I'm going to bless other areas in my life. 
Come on, somebody. I think what happens too often, we in America, we live below the generosity level, above the poverty level, and it's about me, me, me. I don't have enough. I need more. I need a second job. I need a bigger income. I need to make six figures. I need da 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 And we're asphyxiated as Americans on the material things about what money does. I wonder how many among us could start to get asphyxiated on the word of God and the principles of God and say, God, I'm going to do my part. You can trust me. I'm a vessel of honor. I'm a conduit to put into your kingdom. You can bring more into my life. I will not hoard. I will live a great life, but I will not be selfish. I will not be stingy. Why? Because I'm looking to be generous in all that I do. Amen. Think with me for a moment. In, in just in your life, can you identify someone that's naturally generous? Now ask yourself the question, how do you compare to them? Hmm. Did you think about yourself when you came up with a name? Or did you think about someone else? All I'm saying here, that my friend, as we kind of work into our, our, about, about our giving and our giving reimagined, is think about things beyond where you live. Think about things beyond your need. I'm not saying neglect your needs. I'm not saying do all these things. But understand, there is a balance. When I give to God first on my tithe and my offerings, well, then God begins to give me more resources, and my tithe and my offering is the first fruits, and I live on the second fruits. But the second fruits, when God touches it and blesses it, is greater than if I would have kept the first fruits. Are you with me? So what's the big deal, Pastor? I'm telling you, I see the promised land. That's the big deal. And the promised land is greater than where we live right now. I'm not afraid to live, quote, unquote, the proverbial Egypt. What is that to you, Pastor? That's a rented building. I'm not afraid to leave here. We've been on this property. December will be 24 years. Literally, I've been driving on this property for 24 years every week. And there's coming a day soon, saith God, that I'm going to drive on a different property to go to church. And it's going to start a whole other frontier and generation. Why? Because we understood stewardship and us collectively together begin to steward our own resources. Watch me now for the glory of God. The tendency is in the world is to steward my resources for the glory of Tom Durant's. For the glory of my family. I want, want, want. I want, want, want. I want. That's, that's the American. That, we, we wrestle against, I'm going to say, the demon of materialism because it's always get, 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 more, more, more. I understand. I live in America. I'm an American. I grew up in this culture. But when I get into the word of God, somebody, I realize that God's principles and God's promises aren't like the world. He begins to deviate from that mentality. He says, hey, if you'll bring first fruits to me, I will bless you more than you can even contain. I will open up the windows of heaven. Why? Because you trust me with faith, and now I can trust you with more. Mm. My experience, my knowledge of pastoring people, that when God gives back to us, it doesn't necessarily mean he gives me money or money back to me. But when I am generous, he gives me back things that money can't buy. Not necessarily monetarily, but materially. Amen. What about health? What about relationships? I posted this last week on Instagram on my social media. Uh, my, my, my two kids and myself sitting out here in the lobby, and I said, hey, some blessings money can't buy. Good health, good relationships, a loving family, life is great. You know what? That comes from God. I don't know everybody, but I know a few that, that they're, they're estranged from their close family. I don't, that's unhealthy. They don't like that. I want God to bless it. But, but when, when I'm giving to God, God orchestrates my life, and he brings blessings into my life. Now, there are people who could be rich, but you know what? They may not be blessed. Pastor Waddle preached against that last week. You could be rich. You could make a lot of money. You could be evil, and you could be narcissistic. You could be an atheist. Rich isn't quarantined by nice people. A lot of rich people are narcissistic and evil and, and, and conniving and cutting. But what if we could be blessed, come on somebody, in the favor of God, where God blesses me in all areas of my life. I lay down at night, I'm at peace with the world, I'm at peace with my maker, I'm at peace with God. As one song said, all is well with my soul. That's where I'm striving to live. You see, the older I get, I value quality of life. I value comfort. 
I value the minimum necessities, Brother Gustavo. God, family, health. Now, I'm older than some of you, so that may not make sense. But everything else, Donnie, is a plus. It's another, oh, thank God. Thank you, Lord. I receive that. I receive that. But if I got to whittle it down to what makes me happy in life, my relationship with God, my family, and my health, and everything else is a plus from God. So if we're going to focus on quality of life, somewhere in my quality of life, I have to factor in that my relationship with God and my contribution to the kingdom is a part of quality life because quality of life comes from God. My talent, my treasure, my resources, my time. Hello, somebody. We have work day this coming Saturday, 9 o'clock, 8 o'clock. What is it? We need help beautifying the temple of God. And someone may say, well, I'm not crafty. I don't have any tools. You know what? We have 250 chairs out here that have four legs. We have 1,000 legs that need to be dusted. Come on, somebody. Don't tell me there's not work to be done for God. Hey, this is Solomon's temple. This has got to be excellent on top, above board. Now, if you've got a skill set and a talent, bring that too. If you're kind of like me, I don't have much, well, bring a, bring a rag and some WD-40 or bring some 409 and say, Brother Tony, I'm here to polish and shine God's house. What do you want me to do? What are you doing? Now I'm giving my time. Quality of life. When I give to God, law of sowing and reaping, God gives back to me. I want to be generous. Hey, I'm coming down at 9 o'clock, Brother Tony. I'm not going to be late. I brought all my supplies. What do you want me to clean? What do you want me to shine? What do you want me to fix? What do you want me to hang? What do you want me? Hallelujah. Well, Pastor, just preach on living a life of generosity. Yeah, I could be home kicking back doing nothing, but I'm going to be generous with my energy. Mm, somebody, come on. This would be a good time for someone to shout out, that's good preaching. That's good preaching. This would be a good time for someone to shout out, that's good preaching, and then them really mean it. <laughs> yeah, I got the three of you. Okay, I, I knew there was three of you out there. But here's the bottom line, okay? Let me, right here. The devil cannot stop the blessings of God. Oh, the devil's attacking me. Be careful. Don't give him too much credit. Now, I'm not naive to spiritual warfare. I'm, a, I'm an apostolic, spirit-filled pastor. There are spiritual times. There are demonic forces. There are darkness. That comes against. And then we say, in the name of Jesus, you shall be. We invoke the name of Jesus. But not everything is the devil working. And sometimes it's life. Watch this. And sometimes it's my bad decisions. Oh. Sometimes it's my inability to manage the resources so God kind of stops it for a minute so I can get my head in the game. God's never going to bring you more that something that's going to destroy you. Oh, I became so rich and so wealthy. I made it in life. I don't need God. You know what? That's not from God. God's never going to bless you to where it pulls you away from him. But when you are walking in alignment, when you are walking in authority, when you are walking under covering... No devil in hell can stop the blessings of God in your life. Can't stop your calling. Can't stop your anointing. Can't stop your peace. Can't, mm, can't stop your joy. What? Can't stop your financial implosion, uh, explosion. No devil can do that. No force can do that. When I'm walking in alignment, watch me now, I'm protected by the authority of the word of God. So what's the takeaway? Come on, stay in the word. Come on. Walk in the spirit, not in the flesh. Walk in authority. Let it be a lamp unto your feet and a light unto your path. It's the principle. If you sow, you will reap. If you give, you will be blessed. You can't stop the blessings of God if you do what God asked you to do. But here's what the devil can do. He can try to distort your relationship with the blessings of God. You see, people think, I earned it, I worked for it, I deserve it. You see, if we're not careful, there's a spirit of entitlement or pride. Grandpa used to call it pride. Well, that's a little too offensive for the 21st century church in America, huh? Oh, did we hurt your feelings? Pride. That's right. P R I D E. Pride. Well, that's too offensive. We've got to sugarcoat it. So don't forget that every good and perfect gift comes from God, according to James 1 and 17. This is the source of all blessings. It's from God. 
The problem is that we have a dysfunctional relationship with the blessings if we think we earn them. When you earn something, you own it. I want to challenge you to remember why God blessed you. He didn't bless you because you deserved it or to own it. He blessed you for the purpose of the kingdom because he's trusting you. Second Corinthians, you will be made rich in every way. Mm, I like that phrase. You will be made rich in every way. Notice it didn't say financially. And if what you're pursuing is simply material blessings, you are undercutting the goodness of God. La bondad de Dios. You're undercutting the goodness of God. And we are taking every kind of relational intimacy and trusted and long-term relationship and good health to sum it up in one sentence. It's basically right here. Okay? Because God has blessed us with more, we will intentionally give more. Hey, here's the law of showing and revealing. Let me just break it down, okay? When I give more to God, God gives more to me. He replaces what I invest into his kingdom. If I'm investing little, little is being replaced. Pastor Waldo used a scripture last week that it's going to be given back to me measured in the same way I gave it. Am I a selfish or stingy giver? Then it's going to come back selfish and stingy. If I'm a liberal and generous giver, it's going to come back liberal and gener with generosity. So what my purpose of my message this morning here is to get us in the mindset of I want to be a generous person. Generous people give. They give of friendships. You ever have any people in your life and you go somewhere or you go to a party or you do a potluck and they're always bringing like the very little bitty stuff? Hey, why don't you bring dessert? Okay, and they bring a little snack pudding cup. Fifteen of us, we're going to supposed to eat out of the snack cup? Come on. I brought dessert. Yeah, but you're, we're not inviting you next time. Come on, use common sense. Hey, I'll bring all the chips, and you bring a little lunch bag of chips, party of 40 people. What are we supposed to do? Find the scripture and ask God to multiply it like the fishes? Lord, multiply these Doritos in the name of Jesus. Didn't work, man. You better go get some more Doritos or you're not coming back anymore. Or you go out with someone and they never offer to pay their own and never offer to pay. Oh, let me get this. The ticket comes, the bill comes, and you're, oh, my goodness. When we were going to lunch, I didn't know I was paying for four people. I'm talking about Generosity. I'm talking about blessing others. Why? Because I've been blessed. I understand there's a balance, but if we're all working to the tone, the tune of generosity, no, nobody's going to be ungenerous. But it all starts with your relationship and your giving to God. Again, talent, time, treasure. You're, you're talented. What are you doing with your time? Well, I'm making 150,000 a year. And what do you, how does the kingdom win? I give my tithe and offerings. Okay, starting point. Square one. How about this? First grade. No, excuse me, preschool. But when we have a heart for the kingdom, you see, when you have things that you love and it's your passion and it's your hobby, you don't think nothing about spending and going and doing. You could have a hobby of hiking. Okay, I personally don't. My wife's not allowed to anymore. Even if she did have one, I would re I rebuke that desire in the name of Jesus. You stay home. Those of you that don't know, we're in Brazil in March, in Rio de Janeiro. Woo -woo, and she rolls down the trail and sprains both ankles. So we're experiencing the Brazilian medical center at the hospital, which is a little different than ours. So we just have a family agreement that she can't hike. She can barely talk now. But she's getting better. We praise God for that. But, but when you're into something, whether it be whatever, hiking, 
kayaking, cycling, you, whatever gear you need, you go get the best gear because, hey, this is good. I'm, and, and you spend money on the best gear and you practice or you go to the tournaments or you do whatever you do. Why? Because you're into it and you don't think twice and try to negotiate down at Dick's Sporting because, hey, you know what? Will you take 79 bucks for this? Because 99, you're overpriced. We just pay the bill and walk out and we're happy we got a brand new item that's up to date. But why when we come to God, we feel like we want to negotiate, hello somebody, on our consistency when God is not negotiating the bare minimum? I mean, think about your favorite restaurant. What's a, pop one off, tell me. Popeye's, Olive Garden, McDonald's. Let me raise your culinary expectations. I'm thinking, I don't know, Outback, Longhorns, Ruth's Chris, Cane's. Okay, okay, all right, I get it. All right, listen to me, listen to me, okay? Let me show you something. Probably Blue Water Grill, there we go. Come on. What's that? BJ, Sex. okay, all right, I'm good, I'm good. I got enough, I got enough. I got enough for my point. You can start yell stop yelling at me. Okay, but when we go into these places that we enjoy... Do you negotiate? Hey, here's the bill. We pay the bill, and we tip the man or the server, and we go out and we drop 50, 60 bucks. We go home and have a good night, a good day. But when we come to the house of God, do you find yourself being a little less generous? When whatever we enjoy, we find a way to bankroll it. How about we start enjoying the things of God? So God can replenish and give more than what I gave back to God because I have an understanding of the principle of sowing and reaping. And if we're going to get, I'm going to say, to the next frontier, we're going to all have to understand that all things belong to God. God's letting us steward. He said we're a resource for him. And so I'm going to be faithful and generous, and I'm going to give God back what is God's. And at times, I'm going to give more. Mm, come on, somebody. Is this Okay. You see, people are intentional consumers. How about we flip the coin and say, I'm an intentional giver? We get a raise, and for most of us, we think, hey, what can I buy? You pay off a car, you say, oh, I have an extra $410 a month. I should buy a boat. Consumer, consumer. Hey, hey, we, we should do a $9,000 trip to Europe for three weeks. I don't have to make a car payment anymore. And, and I believe... The heartbeat of God is saying, hey, I've blessed you. You've paid off. You're getting debt free. But we think that, that, that we want to be a consumer and buy more. Can I just say, hey, folks, let's, let's, let's commit to God. We're getting on board because we're not going to stay in this rented facility. I'm not going to be driving in here another 24 years on this parking lot. I hope in the next couple years I'm driving into another parking lot because God's making a way and doing things behind the scenes that maybe we know not of. But when God opens that door to the promised land, I've got to be ready that we are all on board, our talent, our time, our treasure, and the bank signs off on it, approves it, funds the loan, and we're in the promised land. What would be a wise student that would not think of counting the cost before you get here? You see, when something materializes on the MLS for our land or our building and, and we, something goes into escrow, I can't come back and teach and train and, and, and hey, this is what we got to do. My, my friend, it's too late. Because they give you 60, 90, 120 days to perform and to teach everybody and to get us all on board. I, I can't do it in three months. We're not buying nothing tomorrow. We're not closing escrow July 11th. But I, I'm preaching vision. I'm preaching, come on, folks, let's get ready. Come on, folks, let's realign. Come on, folks, let's hit, let's hit the reset. Come on, folks, let's get out the binoculars. Let's focus in and, and, and let's get ready because God is opening doors. I already feel it in the spirit. God is opening doors that we don't even know that exist. And when that door opens, we got to be ready to walk through. And I have an obligation to get the church ready that we walk through as a church. Come on now. Children of Israel leave Egypt. Moses gets the word around. So somewhere in the context of the communication is, we're leaving on this day. But I understand Moses didn't start telling the people the day we're leaving. Hey, guess what? I forgot to tell you we're leaving at 1 o'clock. No, there was conversation and preparation leading up to that. Hey, here's what the Lord showed me. 
Here's what God proved to me. And they're communicating and they're getting ready. So when then that day came, the children of Israel and their strategic plan began to march them out of Egypt. And, of course, we know they made bad decisions, had bad attitudes. They meandered for 40 years in the wilderness. That wasn't the will of God. Their attitudes messed it up. Yeah, you're out of Egypt, but your attitude stinks. No stinky attitudes in the promised land. No critical spirits in the promised land. So they wandered and circled and wandered and circled and wandered and circled needlessly. But go back to the original point. They got to exit at some point. What does that have to do with us? Well, this is what it has to do with us, my friend. You know what? We got to get off this rented property. And it's going to take all of us. It's going to take commitment. There are three types of givers. Let me show you this. There are spontaneous givers, which those are givers who give to an event, a project, or a cause. We're in the giving of Mother's Memorial right now. You gave to Mother's Memorial. Last November, we gave $14,000 to the new flooring. Thank God. I love it. It looks nice. Thank you, everybody. Spontaneous. Hey, here's an opportunity. Here's a need. Here's a situation. I'll give. And then there are what I would call strategic givers, which, hey, I'm giving my tithe and my offering. That's strategic. I strategically do that every time I have an increase. And I'm faithful to God, and God's faithful to me. And then the last one I showed on the screen there is sacrificial giving. And these are those who recognize that what we have in this world is not simply ours. It's for the kingdom. You see, what I believe is you can be wealthy and be sacrificial. Sacrifice does play in. Maybe it's not our daily life. I'm not preaching sacrifice this morning. I'm preaching three types of givers and getting us into a mode or a spirit, a level of generosity. I think God's people ought to be generous. Because when we give out and when we deplete our natural resources, God replenishes the resources because they all come from him. So I'm never going to shortchange God. Because when I do that, I'm shortchanging the word of God. I'm going to do my part, and, and, and I want to do more than my part. I'm going to give my first fruits and maybe some of my second fruits when needed. Come on. I'm not going to take, I'm not saying we need to, to pay bills. Today. I'm just saying there's a promised land coming, my friend. Right. And we may be in the, we're in the proverbial Egypt, and we're just going around talking shop. Hey, hey, there's going to come a day we're going to get out of here. We're not going to be slaves. We're not going to be pounding no more sand. We're not going to be stacking no more bricks. We're going to get out of this rat hole. One day I know God's going to lead us out. And we're just talking shop as we're pounding the, yeah, I'll be glad when I get out like this full Pharaoh. If I had this, I'd hit him in the head with it. But I'm hitting these bricks. Yeah, bless God. How much long? I don't know. But we're going to get out of here. Don't lose hope. So they go back to their tent. They go back to their home. Hey, honey, this isn't going to be forever. What are you talking about? I just know there's, there's talk going around at work that we're going to get out of here. We're not going to always be slaves. We're not going to be abused. They're, they're not going to mess with us. God's making a way where there seemeth to be no way. And there's going to come a time that we're going to say, okay, hey, everybody line up. We're leaving on this day. That's what happened back then. So what are you doing, Pastor? This is what I'm doing. Come on, let's get faithful. If you're not faithful, get faithful. If you're faithful, stay faithful. If you're faithful, be strategic and sacrificial and spontaneous. Do what God's called you to do so he can pour more into the body of Christ so we can get to the promise land quicker than if we were trucking on our own. We don't have the resources to man make the promised land. It's got to be a God thing. God opens doors and shows things to us. If we pulled all of our money together, we don't have enough. So that's where the, the supernatural picks up. But watch me now, okay? The supernatural doesn't replace what we're supposed to do. If the supernatural did that, then God don't need people. There's no, there's no people involved. Everything's a miraculous miracle. I've lived 64 years. I've never seen that. 
It's always God partnering with the body of Christ. It's me and us doing our part, teaching and training and understanding and doing what I'm supposed to do. And then God makes a way. God lines things up. God puts an ad. God gives a text. God gives a communication. And things begin to materialize fast when God gets involved. I mean, it's not inconceivable that we're having church here this morning, Damien, and we're not here in August. Wow, that was fast. After 24 years, hey, God did something I didn't see coming. But you know what? When God did it, we were ready. I didn't have to get my house in order, so to speak. I didn't have to get my finances in order. We're just marching time. What are you doing? I'm waiting on God. I'm having church. I'm having good church. I'm preaching good messages. I'm bringing faith. I'm smiling all the way to the promised land. You're still in Egypt. Yeah, there's coming a day, my friend. Don't discount that because God said this. I will and be able to do this. Come on. Look at it through the eyes of faith. I don't need any naysayers. I need some faith believers in the house. Woo! Oh, I got to hurry. I got to hurry. Let me, let me show you this, okay? Keyboardist, you can come. I did make the mention, let me repeat myself. You can be wealthy and, sacri and sacrifice and be sacrificial. Instead of sacrificing one bull when it came to the anointing to be the king, Solomon gave a thousand bulls. Requirement, one bull. A thousand. When he had the chance to offer some oxen, at a sacrifice, David said, I will not sacrifice anything that didn't cost me something. The reason that resonates with me is because I think most people want to give what's left over. It's sacrificial giving, you see. And many times people say, I don't really have much to give. No, 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 no. You've always got something to give. And sometimes you can make the biggest sacrifice. New Testament, Gospels, woman with the two mites. It, it arrested the attention of Jesus. We, I, I don't know off the, I didn't research what's two mites today. I don't know. Two pennies, two dollars, two nickels. The point is, whatever it was, it was very little compared to what everybody else was doing. Right. And Jesus, hey, 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 hey. Did you see that? Right. Let, let me see what she dropped in there. Move that $1,000 check. Move that 5000 cash. Move that 500 bucks. Hey, where'd these pennies come from? You see, so all I'm saying is, it's not the amount. Sacrifice is not defined by amount. If it were, some people couldn't sacrifice. Sacrifice is universal. I don't have much, so I can't give nothing. Whoa, whoa, whoa. Don't rob yourself out of the blessing of God. Don't, don't get that, whoa, I'm poor mentality. No, and let me tell you something, my friend. L listen to me. God's people are not poor. God's people are not busted broke. When you measure the totality of life, one piece in the thousand jigsaw puzzle is money. Let's judge the other 999. Come on, blessed people of God. Isaiah 32 and 8 says, Be generous, people plan to do what is generous and they stand firmed in their generosity generous people plan to be generous here's this okay, I'll close you might say pastor why have you spent so much time talking about this two weeks ago you preached about giving reimagined pastor Waddle preached last week and now, here you are again. Yeah, you're right. I'm not apologizing for that. I don't want to be disrespectful and rude, but yeah, this was intentional. 
It's because I really believe God would not have sent so many people into our church and our network and our influence and ministry for us just to enjoy what we have. I don't believe, I don't subscribe to that. I really believe it's a tremendous responsibility. Here's how I hope we give. I hope we give spontaneously. I hope we give strategically. I hope we give sacrificially. And just like you strategize to get what you want, we strategize to what we give. So God is doing things in the city. And my task, my job, my assignment is get my people ready. He didn't give me the time. I don't know the location, land, building. But we got to get ready. And we're going to give only like only blessed people can give. I want to commit to God. Step one, my tithe and my offerings. That's the income of the church. We have no other income. We have no warehouse. We don't sell nothing. There's no price to discount. There's no BOGOs. It's just us all being faithful in our tithe and our offerings. Generosity begins to expand and open its wings when we are generous spontaneous sacrificial throughout the word of God and the great exploits of the men and women of God in the Bible they've they've all done things spontaneously they've all committed they've all been sacrificial and I don't think the word of God is going to change in the 21st century or it wouldn't be constant. One writer said, heaven and earth shall pass away, but my word? No. It's been here for generations and years. And people are still living by it and proving that God is true. God honors. And so this morning, my assignment is simply to just get us ready. That you go home and think, hey, uh, my starting point is tithing offerings. I don't know of a need, but if something pops up, I'm willing to give sacrificial. I'm willing to give to Mother's Memorial. That's on and above. We're in the midst of that. Maybe something else comes up. Some, I, I know the kids just came back from camp, junior camp and senior camp. I know of a couple of people that anonymously funded some kids to go. Generosity. They don't even have any kids living at home. Hey, I want to pay for a kid. Right. Who told them to do that? Their heart. Right. Hey, I'm blessed. I want to bless somebody. Generosity. But let me just say this and I'll, 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 I'll close. If you're always giving to get and keeping score, you're going to lose. Because in your own human ledger, God's never going to measure up. Every year, we give you an itemized statement on the app. You can check your giving right now. Hey, whatever. We're into June. I've gave God $7,000. He didn't give me nothing. You better be careful. How many accidents did he save you from? How many cars could have rear-ended you on the freeway that you know not of? How many times did you not get sick and have to take your little boy to pediatrics? How many times coulda, woulda, shoulda that spiritual warfare was going on and it never made it to your world? Come on, you can't, you can't quarantine God with black and white paper printouts. How many times were you talked about in the executive boardroom that you're, we got to do some layoffs and your name was on the list, but the information never made it to you and you're still working? Oh, Pastor, you're just making that up. No, my faith goes there. I don't know everything God saved me from, and I don't know everything God protected me from, and I don't know everything that's working in the pipeline, but God knows, and he lets out whatever he lets out in my life. 
a drip feed of whatever God says. But there's probably a whole vat above that that God said, no, that will never make it to him. No, that, that's never going to make it. It's a 10-gallon vat above and a little drip feed. Don't eat, just dripping into my life of goodness. I protected them. I answered their prayer. I saved their little girl. Saved her from what? Nothing happened. That's because I never let it come to earth. That's why you think nothing happened. It happened in the spiritual world. It happened in the spiritual realm. Don't tell me nothing happened. Oh, sorry, God. You see, uh, I didn't see it. That's the problem. Don't judge me by your eyes. And so we live in a blessed life. Stand with me this morning, my friends. God bless you. Jesus. I'm feeling good. I'm feeling encouraged. God is pleased. But let's all do our part, okay? Let's all do our part. And together, we can accomplish more than what partial contribution could accomplish. Ah. Let me pray for us. As I pray, if you have a need in your life, please come. Pastor Ostoff, bring oil. Maybe your need has nothing to do with finances or faithfulness. This is church. We pray for needs. We're not so restricted we can't pray for anything beyond tithe and offerings. We're not so restricted we can't pray for anything beyond the future. You just come on down whenever you want and let us anoint you. Heavenly Father, we thank you for today. I pray that the word of God would not return void. That, Lord, we would steward the resources and the blessings. And a spirit of generosity will be laid on top of this church. Lord, as we walk in alignment looking for the promised land, we're just talking in the shop right now, but there's going to come a time we leave in Egypt. There's going to come a time we're going to build on the promised land, but, God, we're just talking in the workforce right now. We're getting ready. We're lining up. We're making some adjustments. We're cutting some things out. We're doing what you called us to do, and we will do this with faith and boldness. And I bless every hearer today, everyone that's streaming in the spirit. I bless them as they watch this service. God, go from Old Town to Mecula into every situation. I command it and release it in the name of Jesus. We do these things. My friend, come if you want to be prayed for.